Thank you both. Hello. Um, good evening, everybody. It's um, this is new for us to be presenting online. We have presented in person before and we had gotten that down pretty good and this we don't got down pretty good. <laughs> so I am asking for your patience in advance as we're using like a software thing that is temperamental when it deals with us. So um, the reflection questions that we have up here, just something to have in mind um, as we start into this topic. The first one is what ideas do you have about what children do or don't know about gender? And no responses are required. Just kind of think about like, what do kids know about gender? What don't they know? And what assumptions have you heard about children's ability to understand their own gender? That question is on there because there are sometimes people who say, well, my child, you know, said they were a cat yesterday. And so, you know, they'll say anything because they're kids and they don't know what they're talking about. So just kind of keeping in mind, like, what have I heard and what, what might you yourself hold as beliefs about gender and children? And thank you so much for coming to listen to us talk about this. Now say hi. And I'm Christina, uh, Sam's wife and uh, the uh, director of Hillcrest Children's Center, and we're very excited to be here. There. I'm going to let him stay our closet. Let me do that. So the first thing we're going to do is a perspective activity. So you start with your finger above your head, up in the air. Sorry, I'm trying to scoot down. Okay, so with your finger up here and looking up at your finger, start moving it in a clockwise circle. And as you are doing the clockwise circle, slowly bringing it down in front of your face and down to your chest. Now, when you look down, what do you notice about the direction of the circle? Hmm. Let's try that again. <laughs> so starting up above, move your finger in a clockwise direction. And as you are moving it in that clockwise direction, never changing, move it down in front of your face, down to the level of your chest. And when you look down at your finger, you will notice that it is now going counterclockwise. So this is perspective. When we're on one side of something, we can see one thing. Now the thing doesn't change, but because our position or its position may have changed, we have an entirely different, in this case, an entirely opposite perspective of it. So that's really helpful when going into something that I would be willing to bet all of us have been raised with as being one certain kind of way, but actually it's not. Oh, whoops, it did not fully. Well, <laughs> my slide did not fully transfer over. So what is gender? I will just read it to you. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, that's oh, being extra, right here. extra on me. Oh, gender refers to the socially constructed roles and characteristics that pertain to differentiating between masculinity and femininity. So, sorry. We are usually given the choice of one or two things when we're talking about gender. If your first thought is that that's what we find out when the gender reveal cake is cut or the confetti cannons blast in the air based on an ultrasound. Sorry. I know, that's what they can't see. All right, there we go. 
you are a little bit right. This is called someone's assigned gender. What we saw between their legs before or soon after they were born is usually what they go with. This is usually presented as a binary choice, right? We have blue or pink. It's pick one, right? All those cakes are not necessarily rainbow cakes. They're definitely not beige. Here. This is all the same. That's why I'm trying to. Oh, I did not realize that my, sorry, that my screen was cutting me off. I apologize. Like I said, this software is like, confuses me so much. Okay. So when we have the pink and blue, we have a whole lot of things that are, that go with those colors, right? And starting with a baby, like the second that we find out one way or the other, boom, we're gonna get little pink onesies with little frilly socks and little tutus and super cute pink pajamas with like little unicorns and kitty cats. And if it's blue, then we get trucks and we get like daddy's boy and tools and fire and skulls and, um, you know, little tiny cowboy outfits and things like that. So each of these things comes with like their very own set of this is how it is. Here you go, kid. This is what you like. Well, but our kids don't always, you know, go for that. Um, but sometimes they do. Sometimes they go for it a little bit. Sometimes they like both. But we're presented in our society, in our families, that it's this choice or this one. And if you're a girl, then you are much more likely to be characterized as emotional or sensitive or delicate or weak or dependent, or you want to be a mommy, or you want to be a secretary, or you want to be a nurse, um, and that you want to get married to a boy, and you want to have babies. And if you're a boy, you know, with the blue, then you're going to be rough, and you're going to be tough, and you're not going to cry, and you're going to be strong, and you're going to be a leader, and you're going to be a dad, and... You know, you're going to be really focused on winning and be competitive and making money and you're going to be part of the sciences and you're going to be the doctor, you're going to be the lawyer, um, you're going to be the principal, you're not going to be the teacher necessarily. These are the things that historically have been pushed force, forward for our kids to follow. Now, a lot of like schools and families are trying to change this and they're actively pushing back against it but it's still very much there and very much alive in our society is there anything i missed on binary okay so that's talking about the gender binary so let's talk about more into gender and what it comprises. This is called the gender bred person. The gender bred person is a way that um, a collective has come up with to help people understand the differences in gender identity, um, in sex, in ex gender expression, and in attraction. Is there a way to zoom this? Nope, that's a really unfortunate thing. Okay, can you zoom it on that one? So can you see it? So identity is how a person feels and who they know themselves to be when it comes to their gender. 
So that is based in the brain and has nothing to do with what is between their legs. If you look down at sex, now that is talking about the genital arrangement that a baby has. And it is what the doctors look at when they are born and decide, oh, you're a boy, oh, you're a girl. Well, the truth is that there are many different presentations of genitalia that are more on a spectrum between boy and girl, and that is called being intersex. And all it means is that that person has sort of a, a blend or mix of the characteristics of boy and girl. And there are a lot of very common um, different arrangements. Sometimes they are due to genetic conditions. Sometimes it's just the way the child is born. Like that is who they are. They have something, some parts of both. And the sex, so the genital arrangement that the child has, their reproductive parts, do not correspond to the identity, which is their brain. They might, it's possible, but it also just as much might not because they are not tied to each other. So if you look on the left, expression is the really fun part. Expression is what we all do and it is how we express our gender to the world. So that can be the length of our hair, our hairstyle, maybe our hair color, I don't know. That can be, do we wear makeup or not? Do we wear our hair, our facial hair, like in a certain kind of way? Do we have facial hair at all? What kind of clothes do we wear? What kind of shoes do we wear? What kind of cologne might we put on or perfume? or absence thereof. It's the depth of our voice as we are speaking. And there's so many other different ways. It can be body language. It can be the way we sit or the way we walk, um, the words that we choose to use. All of those go into how a person expresses their gender. And expression also does not necessarily have to be tied to either identity or sex. And how that works is that someone may identify as differently than everyone would expect based on their sex assigned at birth, right? So if someone has a penis, the world expects that their identity would be male and that their expression would be masculine. However, there are people who have, uh, are born with a penis, who have an identity of female and their expression, let's say when they're in a safe place, to them, so with their friends, maybe with their family, um, and maybe at you know a, a club or meeting that they go to, they're able to wear the lovely dresses and skirts that they, you know, that bring them delight and that they feel happy and good in. However, when they go to their job, and maybe there's someone who works on the slope, that's a hard place to be a trans person maybe they still wear the masculine clothes and the boots and grow out their facial hair because that is much safer feeling to them. So their expression might not line up with their identity and might line up with their sex, but not always. So that's just how that those things are not necessarily tied together. So if you'll look a little bit below the person, you'll see some small little <laughs> sort of arrows that say womanness and manness or femininity and masculinity or femaleness and maleness. So what it's showing us is that 
it's not a binary spectrum. It doesn't have female on one side and male at the other end, and then it's like a slider in between. It's saying, no, these are independent of each other. And someone can say, have a gender identity that is 20% womanness and maybe 80% manness or 100% womanness and 30% manness. It does not necessarily have to be all one or all the other or one to the exclusion of the other. It can be both at the same time. So something that's really helpful to do, and if you're able to do this on your own now as you're part of the this parent talk, um, you know, think on that. Like, where might I fall? Most people have not ever stopped to ask themselves, where do I actually fall on this? How do I actually feel, honestly and privately, if you don't ever care to share, that is totally fine. But where do I fall on this? Are there elements of both in me somewhere? Maybe there are, maybe they're not. Either way is fine. Also think about your gender expression. Because just because society expects that boys have short hair and girls have long hair, we all know people who break that. Just because society says that girls wear makeup and boys don't, I know plenty of very like comfortably female cisgendered people who do not wear makeup at all. Don't even own it. And I also know some some cisgender men who really like eyeliner. They call it guy liner. But that, you know what, whatever. They want to enhance their eyes and that's what makes them feel happy. So you kind of look on there and think, well, gosh, where might I fall? Do I like to wear pants? Because that used to be a thing too. Do I like to wear skirts? You know, and then it's also a little bit cultural. You know, they have kilts in Ireland and there's always, there's always an exception somewhere not the hard and fast rules we're led to believe are the way they are. Feel free to look at the anatomical sex on there too, at the femaleness and maleness of that. Now, when we're thinking about kids, as a child is forming their gender identity, here, I'll bring myself back. Yay. As a child is forming their gender identity, um, by about one year, they are able to categorize people into gender categories or sort people into gender categories by social cues. And by 18 months, they begin to understand how they fit into socially defined gender roles. By two, they begin to use culturally determined gender labels, so boy and girl, uh, maybe mommy and daddy or man and woman and know that those sort of all line up in little columns and where they fall and where and they're starting to know where they fall under that however this is often based on what we have taught the child that they belong how we have told them this is where you are this is who you are so they are starting to repeat that, but they're also starting to have an awareness of maybe that isn't them. And by around three, most children have established their gender identity. Between two and three, it's very helpful to use emergent listening, which is listening to what the child says. So if the child comes to you and says, I'm a girl, Instead of telling the child, no, you're a boy, you're going to grow up to be a man, you would say, oh, you feel like a girl. What does that mean to you? It's also being attuned to the child. So if they suddenly are like not wanting to wear dresses or like leaning toward the sparkly side of the clothing aisle, it means being aware that your child is showing you and learning for themselves who they are. And they're starting to explore that. So it's really important to support them 
without judgment and just listen and be present like oh you really like the sparkly rainbow shoes like those are so pretty are your favorites the pink and purple ones or the green and orange sparkly shoes like which ones do you like better and just letting your child like whatever it is that they're saying they like by four years old most kids have to like really gotten into the gender stereotypes that they are basically immersed in um, again pre from the prenatal period um, and they are very aware of those cultural messages around gender so going back to my interesting little person here the last thing that i want to touch on so that everybody is aware is of the last part. See the little heart where it says attraction? So that is who someone is drawn to as far as romantic or sexual orientation. And so I'm bringing that up because a very big misconception that exists out in our world is that gender, and sexual orientation are linked together. That a girl, of course, would like a boy, and a boy, of course, would like a girl. And the problem comes in if someone is assigned female at birth, and as they grow, they realize that they are indeed not a girl, that they are a boy. So there is often an assumption that that person would then be romantically or sexually attracted to a girl. And that is not true. It has nothing, one has nothing to do with the other. And it is just as possible for a trans person or a gender diverse person to be attracted to the same sex, same gender, or different sex, different gender, as it is for anyone else. Hey, Sam, before you go to on, we have a couple questions. Can I um, pose those to you quick? That'd be great. Okay, so um, someone asked if you could define cisgender. Yes, oh, I'm so sorry. I should have put that in a slide. That would be very helpful. A cisgender is when someone is assigned a gender at birth, and as they grow, they realize that that is a good fit for them. So if someone is born with a penis and as they grow, they realize, yeah, I am a boy, like that feels right to me, they would be considered cisgender. It means that it lines up with what society would expect. Excellent, thank you for that. And then another person asked if you could read the caption that was under the heart um, for attraction in the um, gender, uh, gender bread man or gender bread person. Yes, let me, let me squint, I can read that. <laughs> it says, attraction is how you find yourself feeling drawn or not drawn to some other people in a sexual, romantic, and or other ways. Excellent, thank you. Those are all the questions that we have right now. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about gender health. Gender health is the opportunity for a child to live in the gender that feels most real and or comfortable to them. Gender health includes the ability for children to express their gender without being rejected, criticized, ostracized, or restricted from living their authentic gender selves. And what happens a lot for kids is that when they're in that very young phase of um, of just starting to become aware of themselves and to express what they like or to express who they are, 
a lot of times adults believe that perhaps the child is mistaken. So they correct the child. But the child is not aware that of necessarily of how they are being seen by the adults. They're more aware of how they're knowing themselves to be. So little kids don't necessarily know all of the things that fall under the pink and blue columns. And so there's, um, there was a very cute example in one of my long ago college textbooks of a little kid who said, you know, I don't know if Alex is a boy or a girl. And the teacher said, oh, well, what do you think? And the little kid says, well, um, I don't know. They have, they have long hair. Um, and the teacher says, well, yes, but, you know, so-and-so also has long hair. And the little, <laughs> the kid says, I know. But, you know, said, uh, the teacher says that, like, oh, the kid's child has a penis, you know, and that means they're a boy. And then the child says, no, everyone has a penis, but so-and-so has long hair, and that means that they're a girl. And so it's, it's just a really cute example of the kids don't necessarily know all of the, the items in those columns, so they're not able to live up to them, and they're trying to share that with us. And so when we respond with correcting them or laughing at them or um, maybe putting them down, like not that that's anything that any of us would necessarily do, but it is what happens, then that leads to shame. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore are unworthy of love or belonging. Many of our early shame experiences, especially with parents and caregivers, are stored in our brains as trauma. And so if you are able to pull up an experience or a situation where you felt that hot burning feeling in your face or maybe your chest of when you made a big mistake and then somebody shamed you for it and you felt so bad you kind of feel like you want to disappear experiencing shame about who you are is not healthy for human beings it leads to so much unhappiness and pain and sadness. It can lead to children withdrawing or trying to hide themselves, of denying themselves. Um, it can lead to body complaints like stomach aches or headaches, or you know, not want reluctance to engage in, in in activities or meet other meet other kids or get out or do anything really. So as adults and caregivers of these kids, we need to watch ourselves for harmful responses. And some of those include microaggressions or invalidation. And what that would look like is using the wrong pronoun for a kid. So if they say that, you know, that they're a girl, then you're going to want to use she pronouns unless the child says otherwise even if that's not what corresponds with what's in their pants. It can be a child saying that they don't want to go by the name that they were given. Maybe it's a really gendered name, um, like Michelle or Robert. Maybe they prefer something like Robbie or Mitch. Um, but if you, they ask and we say, nope, we're not going to do it, that's not your name that's a microaggression. Laughing because your son put on a really beautiful princess dress and, you know, a sparkly wig and is twirling around with a wand and laughing at how, how adorable that is and taking a picture of how adorable that is and sending it to, you know, his 
kid's dad, that could feel really shaming, not appreciated, not like, oh my gosh, you look so beautiful. Look at you twirling and all of those rainbow sparkles, you know, or, or, or even just a neutral response would be less harmful than laughing at them, which shows them that you think that there's something not right. Code switching is when a child knows that it's okay to be who they really are at preschool, but when daddy picks them up, they better not be in that dress. And objectification is treating a person as if they were an object instead of engaging them as a thinking, feeling, learning, and doing human being. So, how to be supportive of children and gender. Yes, dear? I was wondering if it would be good to point out, talk a little bit about the reason why that's gender expensive not to this Or never mind. Continue. So, in, in different studies that I've read and in local groups that I've facilitated, the two most important things that people say would have made the biggest difference for them when they were little. The first one was representation. So if there are no books and there are no movies and there are no cartoons and there are no posters and there are no toys and there are no stories and there are no discussions of gender diverse people, kids are not going to see themselves reflected. And they're going to wonder, what's wrong with me? Why am I not in any of these things? I see my friends in there, I see their families in there, and I don't see myself. Why? Maybe I'm the only one. And so many people grew up thinking that they were the only one that they thought there was indeed something wrong with them, that they were flawed and that they were bad, that they were never going to be wanted for who they were because they did not even know that they were not the only one in the world. The second most important thing to them was that the community around them know and be educated in what, what is gender and what does gender diversity look like. It is wanting your preschool teacher and your parents and your auntie and your peers, so your other like three and four year old classmates, to be aware that there is more than boy and girl so that they are able to be themselves and be understood as themselves at the time as who they are. And so those were the two most important things. The next most important thing was that the parents be supportive that they have the child's back, that they hear the child saying, this is who I am. I do not want to wear dresses. I do not want pink frilly things. I do not like unicorns. You know, I want to be a scientist. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a welder and be supported in that. I want to wear pants every day and I want short hair. For that matter, I don't really want to brush it, shave it all off. <laughs> You know, there are kids that that is who they are and that's who they want to be. And it is on us to support them in who they are. The gender diverse community has a very high rate of suicide attempts and unfortunately suicide completion. And the biggest reason for this is because they are not supported in our society 
in their own families, um, in our country, with the laws that we have. Um, very recently, people have been tr passing or trying to pass laws that, you know, discriminate against gender diverse people. And so living with that as your reality and feeling unwanted for who you are, not because of something that you have control over, but as a basic like part of your existence is so excruciatingly painful that they figure that the only way to escape that pain is by not being part of the world. And the statistics are just as terrible for youth as they are for adults in the gender diverse community. So that is one, re well, that is the most important reason why we need to learn how to talk about gender with kids and how to support that. Oh, thank you. And my wife just reminded me of another study that I had read that the children, so they took a, a large group of children, like several hundred children who had been able to fully transition. So socially, not medically, we're, you know, we're talking about very little kids, like under 12. And so a child who has fully socially transitioned, meaning they changed their name, they changed their pronouns, they changed all of their gender expression to what fit right for them, that their parents, their teachers, their extended family, their peers, their siblings, everybody saw and acknowledged them as who they are. They listened and they said, okay, we see you. We love you. You are you. Those children, did not have the anxiety and the depression and the mental health challenges that other gender diverse children who are not allowed to transition have. Proving that there is nothing mentally wrong with a gender diverse person for being gender diverse, that the pain and the agony and the distress comes from being rejected and being told you are not okay as you are you are not wanted and you do not matter as you are you need to fit what i think you should be if you want to be loved and that causes like a a division in their mind because i don't know if any of you have ever tried to be something that you aren't but it usually doesn't last very long and it definitely isn't very comfortable. And if you would like to experiment with that <laughs> feeling, imagine wearing the clothes of the gender role that you currently hold, wearing the opposite to work, to the store, to see your friends, and just think about how people would respond or react if you did that. And that is what it's like for a gender diverse person to try to pretend to be someone they aren't. It feels just as strange and just as uncomfortable. Another good metaphor that, that I'd heard, if it's helpful, is that trying to live a gender that you are not is like wearing your shoes on the wrong feet. You keep trying to take them off and put them on the right feet where they're actually comfortable. And your mom or dad comes over and no, 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 those are the wrong feet. We have to change your shoes back on the right feet. There you go. And they stick your shoes back on the wrong feet. And that does not feel so good to walk around in. It's not comfortable. It looks funny to you. It doesn't feel right. And you can't wait to get them off so you can put them where they're supposed to be. So, hopefully people have questions. <laughs> Otherwise we have resources. Otherwise we have resources. All right, any questions? 
sorry, bath time's happening next door. But I just wanted to say that last analogy is uh, even just for uh, situations where I've been super uncomfortable, where I haven't been myself, where somebody's asked me to be a different person that I don't feel like I am, that analogy of the shoes being on the wrong feet and somebody correcting you over and over again is like spot on. I could feel the anxiety of my shoes being on the wrong feet. And so I really appreciate that analogy. It's, I can feel it. My face felt hot. So um, spot on with the analogy. Thank you for that, Sam. Does anybody have any questions? Please feel free if you want to put them in the chat or uh, feel free to unmute yourself um, at this time. And if not, we can go ahead and go to resources and I'll keep an eye um, on the chat during this time. Okay, well, feel free to interrupt. I, I actually oh. have a question, sorry. Uh -huh. Um, I like statistics. So can you share what percentage of population, however, whatever st statistics you have, identify as transgender or not right? They, their body parts don't match what's in their head. The gender diverse? Yeah. Well, however you need to put it. I don't know what kind of statistics you have, but just curious, what percentage is this? If you'll hold a second, I'll go grab the most recent one that I have. I believe it was 0.6% of the population. Um, let me look that up. But I believe that's what it was. And in the, just as we were present, uh, getting ready for the, or I was reading some of the, one of the books this last month, um, I found it really interesting that the rate of intersex, so that's with the, gen uh, the genitalia, the anatomy um, is as prevalent in the in the population as you see almost as, as much as you see redheads. So just to get an idea of like how many people um, would be intersex is this how many redheads that you know in your life. And so that just goes into say, you know, that that, that assumption um, is there. The other thing that comes in with gender you know, the gender expansive community is that there's not a overarching you know statistics being done we don't do a census analysis and and because so often it is not safe for children or adults to identify and come out and so we'll see that any of these things will be underrepresented numbers um, but I will say as societies become more um, understanding of this and the children who, you know, our youth are just really standing firm on this is who I am. And I think that's where a lot of it's, it's following their lead. Those numbers are just, it's just, we're starting to see that it is more prevalent than what we thought. So looking it up, um, it is so an estimate, it says an estimated 1.4 million adults, so it's 0.6% of the U.S. population, identify as transgender. Um, but due to the way that the survey question was asked, that may not have accounted for a significant portion of the gender diverse community that does not consider themselves transgender, such as people who identify as non-binary, genderqueer, or, you know, another um, gender label like that. Thank you. Is there another question? So I saw on here that there's a few, there may be a few early childhood providers on here. And so I'm just going to give my little soapboxy spiel um, from uh, that about our ethical responsibility. And so as an early childhood educator, we have a professional code of ethics that we follow and it um, outlines just when we're coming in with decisions and interacting with children, families, our colleagues, and the community, um, just guiding us to make sure that we're making ethical um, decisions. And so 
with that, the number one <laughs> overarching of all the Prince values and principles, and I usually, if when I'm doing, we're doing the training for that community, we go into that. But the number one is do not cause, do no harm. And because the research is so clear that not being open and attuned to children at during early childhood and being open and giving them the full variety um, of full diversity of humanity as is presented to them is harmful. It is very, you know, they have made it very clear that addressing the diversity of gender expression in early childhood through materials, through the books that are available, training of the teachers is an important part of being a professional. And so that's my, my spiel because that's really, it's, it is something very new and, um, you know, and, and is takes a lot of self-reflection um, and working with, uh, with children. So given that I'm going to share a few of my favorite, we have lots um, of books on here. So this for one is, um, hopefully that comes out correctly for them. Who are you? Um, and it feels good to be yourself. And both of these are really easy to, you know, books where they just talk about the difference of gender identity and gender expression. And they use a nice thing that when you're born, babies can't talk. And so parents make a guess of what someone's gender is based on their gender genitalia. And sometimes you're right and sometimes they're wrong. And so then they talk about, you know, how you know you best. And so it's really empowering for kids. And it just gives, both of these are really good on, um, on just being understanding that you're okay. Because we talked about having yourself, um, just knowing that there, that there is, that you are not alone is really important. Another one that does not talk about gender directly, but talks about being mislabeled because it's a crayon that is mislabeled and how they are trying and they just do not fit in until they are finally understood that even though like that this crayon is red, even though everybody kept saying it's blue. And it is a great way when we use that one in the class about talking about how unfair that was to the blue crayon or to the red crayon because everybody kept saying that they were blue and how that would feel. And so it's a good way for kids to develop empathy um, through, through a story. And um, I mean, we have, we have lots of books that I could talk about. As an adult, um, it's for parents um, and in coming through, because this is, you know, when you have a baby, we have assumptions. <laughs> and we put a lot on children, even though we're told not to about expectations and, and envisionments of what your family life's going to be like and their future. And so some good, um, a podcast that kind of talks about that um, from a parent is How to Be a Girl. And it came from Seattle and now it's picked up and by NPR. And it's just a mom's uh, talk about their um, journey with their trans daughter. Um, but really, what I like about there, and it's the same thing that I and the parents of trans or gender diverse children that we've, that I've dealt with um, and met in Anchorage, is it really comes down when they talk about, you know, supporting their child in this transition and there is to them, it wasn't a choice because it was the only way their child was going to survive. And it was because of the mental health things and it took a lot for their children. And some of them make, you know, caught on earlier when they were younger in early childhood. And some, it was, you know, at the beginning of adolescence, but it really came for them. That was like, it, there just wasn't another choice. And that when they did accept and understand what was going on and support their child, they all, I mean, I just have repeatedly heard them say, we got our child back, our happy child who, you know, and, and that relief for the family. And so. That's awesome. We had a couple questions come in if you guys would be willing to um, yeah. answer. So one came, one shared is like, I am a total learner, um, not to sound, you know, like this is a silly question or anything, but they said, 
Um, much was discussed about gender presenting their preferences. What about female being attracted to female, but is not necessarily masculine? Is there a category or a classification for that? Um, so they're just asking. Um, so the term that comes to my mind is a lipstick lesbian, and that is a feminine woman who is attracted to other women. Awesome. So I, not really like a child term, but um, thank you for asking. Yeah. Great. And another question that came in was, can you mo explain more about non-binary or genderqueer, what genderqueer means? Sure. Non-binary is someone who does not necessarily feel like all one way or all the others. So there are trans people who do identify in the binary. So someone who was assigned male at birth says, nope, I am 100% female, I am a woman. And so that is in the binary. And non-binary would be somebody who feels like, hmm, I feel kind of like both man and woman all together in me. And maybe that's a blend that feels like personal only to them. Maybe it's that they feel bi-gender, which would be about half of each or so. So, you know, like bisexual means I like men, I like women, bi-gender, I am a boy and a girl. Non-binary would be like, I'm sort of a boy and sort of a girl, maybe sort of not. And then there are agender people who feel that they do not have a gender, that there is not a category for them, that they are just a being and that they exist outside of gender. Gender queer would be like, mm, I'll do what I want and nobody's going to tell me what to do. And gender fluid can be, today I'm 100% a girl, tomorrow maybe I'm non-binary and then Thursdays I'm always male. And I'm making a little bit of like lighthearted of this, um, but it's all sort of somewhere floating around in those categories. And those two children books that I had talked about talk about all those terms and how that comes in. Um, and, you know, my experience in our center when we bring in staff who um, use they, them pronouns or, or, or don't, is that they're just accepting that this is the way it is when you're just like, oh, this is it. And I don't feel this. They just kind of look and they're like, oh, okay. And they just go on and playing. And it isn't because they don't have all the baggage that we have. It's just, oh, this is it. Or, you know, oh, so that, you know, so-and-so's mommy is now so or and so's daddy. And so when they were like, well, they wanted their insides to match their outsides. Um, yeah. And and one of the kids is like like all pink and gooey, <laughs> <laughs> and we're like but, oh god, <laughs> they're like no, and so we say, but then they were like okay that that is that is you know that is what I mean it just it is because children are just understanding trying to figure out how the world works and it's our job to just like, explain it and so when we explain it in simple terms and um, in supportive they it, it was just was not has not been a big deal. That actually goes in really well to one of the other questions that was put in the chat box. What are some age appropriate ways to explain gender diversity to young children when they see a gender diverse person in the community and have questions? Mm. I, I think one things that we, that we've talked about and how to do anytime when you're starting to bring in diversity um, and, and so to not be like a touristy or a, it highlighting the, the difference um, is to make sure that, you know, having those like a foundation and understanding of what that means for them. And so that everyone has a label. So, you know, everyone has a, a race, not just black people or brown people or, you know, Afri everybody has a gender. And so you, your cisgender, gender, you know, everyone has a label. Um, and then it really starts like for, for us, it was just talking about pronouns and being aware of it and being understanding what your pronoun is and then starting to practice asking people what their pronouns are and you know and just being open to that to and so that they just know to ask when you don't know you don't make an assumption and you ask um and i teaching kids that that some people use different pronouns like some people use they them 
And having that conversation before a situation comes up is so when your child sees someone at the store and they say, you know, mommy, is that a boy or a girl? And you can say, well, honey, first off, they're a person. And sometimes people don't feel like either one of those things. And sometimes they style their hair or they dress in ways that reflect more of who they are. So maybe this person is telling us that they don't feel like either of those things, or maybe they feel like a combination, but we don't really know. So with that person, we can ask, you know, do you use they, them pronouns? Do you use he, she, what pronouns do you use? And just teaching kids that it's okay to ask and it's not embarrassing to ask if they need to know, if this person's like, you know, far off, then you don't need to chase them down. But. I and having gone and really started examining this, it um, and, and working with it and just applying it in in my life and our and our family life and at the school is we started realizing that it was just good to have some just guidelines of we just don't comment on people's bodies. That that just seems to be a really good rule that we just planned. Like we just don't comment on people's bodies. Just say safe. You don't you don't need to like you know make sure that you're not putting because there's so much value that comes into it. Cause even when like people say that they've lost weight and people are like, Oh, you look so good, which then automatically assumes that you don't look good when you're not, um, you know, just, it stays just in the, to a healthier interaction with people. And then we, um, in discussing that this with our kids and stuff, we started like, in, you know, talking about, well, do our animals, do we really know the gender of our animals? We know their sex. And so it was a way for us to start using gender neutral pronouns um, with using they, them with the animals. And so, I mean, it, you know, it was just, well, we don't know what, how they identify. And so it's a good way to practice um, because, you know, especially, you know, it's so many of us were raised with the binary and now we're, you know, and then you're, you're you know, and what was it? five years ago before we had the bathroom bill that came up in Anchorage, you know, the statistic was more people had seen a ghost than knew a trans person. And so, so that was really like, I mean, that was just a really funny, I mean, but, but telling statistic. And then the bathroom bill happened in Anchorage and we were the first um, city in the nation to not, to have, to not have it pass. To defeat it at the ballot box. At the, to thank you, defeat at the ballot box, and in the um, the campaign. research campaign and researches, it was because people in Anchorage that were trans came out and said, "This is me," and so people realized, like, "Oh, I didn't realize that that parent at my school, you know, was trans," and it just made it very. You you just realize that oh but that's a good person like this is these are real people and not an idea or like you know strange like like a bog witch out there like living you know out in the tundra like <laughs> just regular people like your neighbor and so we've moved you know and that that came into it and then and it really is I mean it's these young people who are then now coming to us this you know and saying well I'm gender queer or a gender or and that even like for, you know is it was like oh okay wait this there's a gender gender expansive and it is not we're moving out of the binary and when you get into it and we don't you know like i said this is like a six hour training that we could we start doing um but then we get into really talking about intersectionality and how gender plays into depending on you know your culture that you you know which part of the world you live in or the country, um, your race, and all those things, your income, and how that plays out. Um, but we're not, that's like gender 304 or something, you know. But. We have one more question. Oh my gosh, all these questions are flying in. This is amazing. Now everyone's like, oh, tell me more, tell me more. We're at 7.05. Can we ask a couple more questions? Do you guys mind? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, feel free if you guys have to um, take off. Feel free. You can um, feel free to go. But these the conversation is really great right now. So someone asked, where can we direct families who are asking these types of questions um, or struggling with this topic, whether it's in their own family or they're just struggling with the topic in general? Hmm. Well, there's lots and lots of information online. 
like a ridiculous amount. Um, and there are lots of good resource lists out there. I know that Identity, I believe, has some really good lists of resources on their website. Identity is the local LGBTQ um, support organization in town in Anchorage. Um, and there used to be, and there may still be going forward, a group, a support group for parents who have a gender diverse child. And so the parents of these kids were coming together and being able to talk about that and experience with each other and you know what part was hard and like how can we celebrate our child how do we you know support them in this um and so if that's something that you're interested please check out their website and look for some of the resources that are on there you can also um we have a list compiled and so you could email us at hillcrestak at gmail.com um and then you know but identity is a really good one for just general um and I think it just goes into is, you know, I, in doing this, it wasn't, you know, I did have a conversation with a family who was not, um, when we, when we were, had a gender diverse, um, situation at the center and, you know, you can also find information that counters what we said here. And so it's making sure, um, but it didn't take much research on the figuring out that these people weren't really, they weren't medical providers. They weren't there. It's really clear. Um, and the American medical association and, you know, national association for education, young children, young children have all come out and said it, you need to how to be supportive. And so that really is, is the most important thing is that you're looking at, at everything that talks about being supportive. And then for parents, I had an, in an article or that is their, there is a process for some some of them about just what you thought was the situation not being there and that and how to correctly um and get support for that for parents um because so that you can be fully supportive for your child meaning parents who have a gender diverse child and who were not expecting that and who had sort of created these stories and this this existence for their child in their own mind you know when the child was born and this is like what they expected their child's life would sort of roll out to be like and then are finding like wait that I've got to pull all that back in cuz that's not where this child is they feel a sense of sadness for this story that they had built out that is not really probably going to be the child's truth. And so the parents are feeling like some mourning and loss and sadness. And so they get to go and process that with other parents and never ever with the child themselves, because the child's going to say, I've always been who I am. If I am 30, then that's because you weren't listening to me when I was, you know, five. So, the last question that came in was, do you guys have a, res a, a good website for terminology that people can go to? I have found Planned Parenthood to have a really good website with lots of really clear, easy to understand definitions. Um, so, if you just go to just a general Planned Parenthood website um, and kind of look around in there under probably gender, um, you will be able to find that. I actually cited it in my master's project paper, so. <laughs> awesome, I've been putting some of the resources that you guys have talked about between identity and then your email address as well as the Planned Parenthood in here. I also okay. added some of those book titles um, that you both uh, brought up too, which is super, super helpful. Um, I feel like I could talk and listen and ask questions for like four more hours, which I know that you guys would probably love to do as well, <laughs> but not on a set seven o'clock PM. Right. Um, so I am absolutely so very, very grateful for um, the information, the honesty, the openness, the teaching, um, everything that you guys have put together for um, 
tonight for Parent Talk. So I am absolutely appreciative and thank you for everything. This has been so amazing. And um, if anybody has any final words, um, we'll close up for the evening. Um, Sam or Christina, do you guys have any final thoughts? I will be giving you, a, I'll send you some resources and maybe you can put it on the link underneath here, the yeah. list, um, because there's also this really great one, which is supporting gender diverse um, diversity. diversity in early childhood education. Specifically. So. And I appreciate everyone's patience with our <laughs> software and I apologize for the weird, like slightly lengthy pauses a couple <laughs> of times when I got overwhelmed yeah. and lost my place <laughs> in my papers. So we have to pare down the training so far. I was like, oh gosh, we pared it down a little too far. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but in trying to squish it all into like the 45 minutes. This was so. amazing. Thank you so, so much. Um, again, so grateful. Um, so uh, we have next month, we have Parent Talk. Um, again, the registration opens up uh, Monday morning and the session is called... Um, positive responses to challenging behaviors. Um, so stay tuned for those on our thread website and feel free to register for that. Um, until then, thank you everyone for participating and um, stay tuned for an email tomorrow. I'll send out a link for um, a, a survey and also some of the resources that were um, discussed tonight. So thank you all for participating. Thank you all. <laughs>